Hey everybody. Um, since MySQL 5.6, the default storage engine is inodb. And since 5.5, the recommendation has always been to use inodb for general purpose workloads. There are exempts where you can choose for something else, but for general purpose workloads, um, inodb is, is, should be your first choice. Before 5.6, the default uh, was MyISM. Uh, however, the MySQL system tables, like where your users are stored and your grants are stored and all, all those things are stored, before MySQL 8, they were also still using MyISM. However, everybody recommended to use inodb for everything. MySQL internally was still using uh, MyISM. Um, since MySQL 8, that has been changed. So there's the new data dictionary in MySQL 8. Um, and now all those system tables are also using inodb. Uh, and since 8.0 is the first time ever that you can uh, disable uh, myism, and there's also the first time ever that uh, there was uh, a feature removed from the uh, from the server as part of an upgrade, so from the search engine, uh, so the table exporting. And how you use a storage engine is fairly simple. So you have a create table statement and you basically say which engine you want to use. If you don't specify an engine, it will use the default, uh, but you could specify the engine uh, type that you want to use. So for example, create table, blah, 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 engine equals inodb, and then your table will be using inodb as a storage engine. Uh, a little bit about my ISM, and this is the, the, the storage engine that is, has initiated the holy wars because everybody was saying like, hey, MySQL is, does not have transactions, it does not have foreign keys, it does not only have table level locking and all those things. Uh, that was true. Uh, my ISM didn't have all those things, but for a very long time, inodb is, was already existing. And for a long time, it was like a plugin to the server that you had to specifically uh, enable. Since 5.5, the uh, IDDB plugin has been the default inside the server. Um, and that has made things uh, a lot more easy to configure and to use. The only, the only other thing that I will say about my ISM is if you, uh, if you look at uh, your, uh, your data directory, where the data is stored, my ISM stores your tables into two different files. Uh, so the, T, the, the table name.myd is contains your data and then the myi contains your indexes. And then before ADO, there was also an FRM file, which is the, uh, the data dictionary. It, it was the, the place where the metadata about uh, the, uh, the schema was stored. Um, the current default storage engine, INODB, general purpose storage engine, it has uh, full ASIC compliant transactions. It supports multi-version concurrency. Uh, you can have uh, row level locking. Uh, there's uh, Oracle style consistent reads. You have foreign keys, compression, encryption, and a single table can hold up to 64 terabytes of storage, uh, which is qu quite a lot if you want to put uh, 46 terabytes of storage in MySQL and, and be uh, fair and, and work with that uh, very um, fluently that will be will require a lot of uh, horsepower in your server. Uh, this slide alone uh, is, is a two hour talk, talk so I'm not going to go into too much details but you can see that there's uh, in memory structures and on disk structures. Uh, on disk is obviously where your data is stored. So you have the system table space, which is the default place where data is stored, but you can also have um, uh, other general table spaces or uh, file per tables uh, table space if file per table is on. And then each table gets its own table space on disk. The most important uh, um, in-memory structure is the buffer pool. Everything you read or write uh, to inodb will go through the buffer pool. Uh, and so the default is still uh, 128 megabytes. So in, in either way, if you, if you have more than uh, 256 megabytes of uh, memory available in your server, which most servers have nowadays, you should sh change the buffer pool to a higher number uh, uh, because everything your reader writes in INDB goes through it. Some best practices for inodb, always define a primary key. 
Um, use the most frequently queried uh, columns. Um, if no obvious primary key can be found, then use an auto increment column. So it's just an, a counter that goes up from one to uh, to the maximum value of your of your data type. Um, turn off auto commits. Committing hundreds of times per second puts really a cap on performance. Um, it limits. Uh, it's limited by the write speed of your storage device. So every commit needs to be persisted. Um, uh, to a log file, to a reader log file, maybe to a data file. Um, so uh, try to turn off auto commits and try to group your your mod your DML so any any change to the data in a transaction using begin or start transaction, and then at the end commit or rollback if you want to roll it back. Uh, but it really will make an imp uh, a very big uh, improvement on your on your performance. Um, if you if you use transactions and not use just auto commit, where every uh, every query on its own is a, is a is a transaction, and so that really puts a limit on what you can do. And inodb file per table, it's also something very very useful uh, to not have one giant IB data file, uh, but have um, all your tables in a separate data file, um, uh, which will uh, improve performance also. Um, and it will be better for um, for a lot of things. It's default since 5.6, but if you're migrating an older version, then you probably will want to turn this on. Other storage engines very quickly, NDB cluster storage engine is used by MySQL NDB cluster, which I briefly touched in my introductory slide. It's the cluster solution. Uh, it's an enterprise uh, edition feature, so I'm not going to go into much detail. Uh, you have the memory storage engine stores data in memory, but not on disk, obviously. Then black hole is very funny. It redirects your data to DevNull. So if you uh, do create table engine black hole, then you can write a lot of data to the table. It will be very performant, but it will never be stored on any disk. Uh, CSV, you can uh, use comma separated values, uh, federated, uh, sorry, archive uh, for a large amount of unindexed data. You cannot delete or update anything in the archive storage engine, but if you have like uh, a lot of writes um, that you only sometimes read and they can never be changed, the archive storage engine is there for you. Uh, federated, uh, it allows you to access tables on a remote MySQL server. Be aware that this might be fairly slow. Um, so if you want to use this, there's use cases for it, uh, but think about it very carefully before you use this. Uh, RocksDB is some is developed as a new search engine based on my uh, my rocks is the MySQL variant, so it's based on RocksDB. It's uh, whereas all the other uh, search engines are uh, B3 um, based search engines, are the uh, RocksDB is a log structured merge tree. Uh, storage engine, it's optimized for writes and storage space efficiency. It was developed by Facebook. Um, they have presentations about that in the open. Um, it saves them about 50% on this space. And if you're their size, then obviously that makes a big difference. Uh, it's not available in the default community server. Um, it is bundled with MariaDB uh, since 10.2 and 10.3. Um, and it's available as a separate package if you use uh, Procona server since 5.7. Um, so if you want to use RocksDB, uh, you should use either MariaDB or Procona server. Um, but it, it, it really is optimized for write and storage space. If you have a specific need for an LSM tree based storage engine, RocksDB or MyRox is there. Uh, given that this talk was originally written for uh, Oracle, um, DBAs, um, MySQL does not support PLSQL. Uh, there's a basic implementation of stored procedures and events. And my speculation is that this will not come in Oracle MySQL because they have their big brother Oracle database. And I don't think that uh, there will be much traction inside Oracle to start implementing something like this in MySQL. Uh, MariaDB understands a subset of PLSQL. It does not fully support it. Um, there's an SQL mode called Oracle uh, in, in since MariaDB 10.3. And this just adds a list of aliases to support Oracle SQL dialect, like stored procedures, things like that. 
if you want to select from dual, uh, like you could do in, in Oracle, uh, Oracle SQL most supports that in MariaDB, but yeah. Next major subject, and I still have 15 minutes, which is good, is replication. Um, replication enables data from one MySQL database server, which used to be called the master, but since uh, the recent uh, inclusive, inclusivity um, jargon changes, they are now starting to refer to as the source server to be copied to one or more database servers, which they call the replicas. Replication is asynchronous by default. Uh, replicas do not need to be connected permanently to receive updates, depending on the configuration. You can replicate all selected databases or even selected tables. Advantages of replication, you can do a read scale out. Your data is, uh, you can write on one place and read from many other places. Uh, you have data security because your data is no longer in a single server. You have multiple servers where you can read the data from. You can use it for analytics, like if you have really big analytics queries that you want to run, but you do not want to uh, take away resources from your your production or your uh, OLTP services. You can just set up an analytics replica um, and run your, your slow queries there and none of the other uh, installations will be um, will be impacted. Or you can do it for long distance data, data distribution if you have slow links between uh, between data centers, uh, asynchronous uh, helps there. Uh, the, the the source server does never have to wait on the on the replica before uh, going on or moving on. Um, so yeah, there's some so some uh, statements there you can use to configure replication. So you do change master to, and this will probably be, be changed to change source to in the future. Um, then you can do start stop replication, start slave or st start or stop slave, which will become start to stop replica. And to diagnose replication, you can run show slave status. In the future, that will be show replica status. Um, but for now, this will, this will still work. Um, to support replication, MySQL has something called binary logs. And each DML, so any modification or data DDL data definition is written to a log file called the binary log, if it's enabled. It's not enabled by default, but our general recommendation is to enable um, uh, binary logging. Um, no information about the user executing the query storage, so it's not suitable for audit logging, um, but uh, and events are identified uh, by a file and a position. So in a fi the, 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 the event that you're referring to is stored in a specific file in a specific position. And replicas are configured with this file and position to know where to start reading the binary logs from. Uh, there's three formats. Well, basically, well, there's two formats of binary logs. You have statement-based uh, replication, statement-based uh, binary log format, and then in the binary logs, there are statements written uh, the same way as they were processed on the source server, and the replica just re-executes the same statement. If you have a row binary log format, then the changed row data is written to the binary log and the replica will just need to update the row information on its local copy and not need to execute the entire statement again. So no optimizer anymore, no. It will just update the rows that it needs to. Uh, mixed, state, mixed replication is a, a combination of both. So it uses statement-based replication by default, except when it detects something non-deterministic and it switches to row. What's the danger with, uh, with statement based if your statement has something called like a UUID function. So you do insert into table uh, UUID values UUID. Um, if you do that, if you execute it on the master, that will give you a different result than if you have executed on the slave. There are some uh, mitigations done in the binary log format or in the binary log uh, specification to mitigate some things like now or, or things like that. But still there, there are, queries where it will be uh, a problem. Like if you do an insert, insert into select from, um, if the select returns a different result on the replica than on the mass, on the, on the, on the source, uh, then there will be differences in your insert. And with row-based replication, uh, that will never happen because uh, you, you store in the binary logs the data that is changed, that is written, that is actually written uh, uh, on the site, on the, on the source server. 
uh, binary logs are like a stream of all the changes that occur inside the MySQL server. And each event also has a, has a timestamp attached to it. So it can be used for point in time recovery. So if you have, for example, a developer doing a delete on a table without a where clause and have all the data in the table is gone, uh, you can restore up to the point where uh, that delete happens. So to do that, you, you obviously need to have a backup first of all the data. Uh, so you, you restore the latest backup that, that you have available. And then you identify the binary log position where that delete happens. And yet now you replay uh, all the binary logs from your backup, uh, from the point that your backup says that it, it was uh, cr created. So the binary log position at that time, right until the position just before your delete. And now you have the exact same state of the table uh, that had to delete and you can use that now to to restore your original table or you can use this instance to continue your work um, in order to do that you must have your binary logs around long enough until you have a successful backup so uh, backups are important but it's also important to back up your binary logs or at least keep them around until you have confirmed that your backup is successful once the backup is is there all the, all the binary logs before that are, are becoming irrelevant because all the data is already in the backup. But um, everything after that point in time that the backup completed, uh, you don't have. And so it's important to keep the binary logs around. And we usually recommend, please back up your binary logs. So in case something goes wrong, we can reconstruct many of the things that we had. Since 5.6, there's a, a new uh, aid for replication, which is called a global transaction IDs. And file and position are still the primary coordinates in the binary log. But a global transaction ID can make identifying these coordinates more easily. So each transaction gets a unique identifier, which is also written to the binary log. And all the servers in the topology will keep track of the GTIDs they have executed. And when a slave connects to a, a master, uh, so when a replica connects to an origin, uh, to source, um, I still have to change the slide, it seems, uh, the, the, uh, the, or the source server uh, announced the list of GTIDs uh, uh, it has executed, and the slave says, this is what I have. And so the difference between those two sets is what the replica will need um, to, from the master to, to get itself up to date. Uh, and this is one of the major breaking points where MySQL and MariaDB are no longer uh, dropping replacements because they both have a different implementation of GTID. Uh, and so you cannot replicate from one to the other uh, when you have GTIDs enabled. And GTIDs do make your life a lot easier. <clears throat> so I will quickly show you what, why this is different. So in MySQL, Oracle MySQL Community Edition, uh, a GTID has the format of the server UUID, which is the, the, the UUID like you like you see here, and then the sequence number. And the, the server UUID is generated at initial startup, and each transaction uh, starts with the UUID of the server where it originally occurred. So if you run a query, uh, uh, an insert, an update, a create, whatever, whenever it gets binary locked, there's a... a a unique transaction number added to it, and it, it uses the server UID of the server where that transaction happened. And then there's an ever incrementing number of transactions executed, which is called a sequence number. And so you can have uh, a GTID looking like this. So you have the UID and then transaction number 23. You can, uh, sometimes people talk about GTID sets. It's a collection of GTIDs. So in this case, this has the same source uh, UID. But in this case, you have transactions one, two, and three, and then transaction 11, 47, and 48, and 49 are in this GTID set. And instead of specifying a master log file and the master log position in the change master command, you can now use uh, master auto position equals one, and then the server will figure out file and position based on the executed GTID sets. Now, when you look at MariaDB, GTIDs are a total different form. Um, so, 
uh, MariaDB has basically three uh, integer values, uh, X, Y, and Z. And the X is the domain ID, and it usually defaults to one, unless you have a multi-source replication, where you have a replicate from multiple masters, multiple sources. Um, but in, in most cases, this will be just one. So you, you have only one there. Then the second number is the server ID, is the unique ID of the server where the transaction occurred. Instead of using something new uh, like a UUID, MariaDB has chosen to use what was already there, which is the server ID. And then the Z, the last number, is basically the same as with MySQL GTIDs. It's an ever incrementing value that you that you uh, that that just auto increments on each transaction. So there's a global variable called GTID slave pass, and you can set this value when you load it in the server. For example, when you uh, load a backup um, in the backup metadata, there will be um, a slave position, and you, you you change that value to to whatever your metadata if your backup says. And once this is set. You can use, uh, you have the option to use a master use GTID and you use a slave position in the change master command. So you set a master use GTID equals slave position and then it will use the, the position that it has into its values from the metadata which you loaded um, to start replicating. Um, GTIDs are enabled uh, by default uh, since 10.0. And in an existing replication topology, when you have replication running um, and everything is up to date, you can just do stop slave, change master to, and then use GTID set to current position. And then you just start slave and it continues from where it left off. But from now on, it will identify uh, transactions using the GTID instead of just the file and the position, which will make it much easier uh, to track where everything is in, uh, in your uh, in your uh, topology, uh, as I said in in the beginning, uh, a replication is asynchronous. So uh, by default, um, it means that the source server executes a statement. It writes it to the binary log as an event. The replica has two threads. It has an I/O thread and an SQL thread, and it pulls the source for new events constantly. Stores them locally in a relay log, and then the replica has a thread that replays the relay log on its local data copy. There are no guarantees that the, the replica will will be able to execute the event. There, the table that it's trying to change might not be there. There's no guarantees. The master doesn't care about all of that, or the the source. Um, and it also, there's also no guarantee when or how fast a replica will execute uh, this event. It can be immediate, it can be an hour later, it can be five hours later, it all depends. And that's what they call replication lag uh, and so uh, or delay, and that is inherent to this principle of asynchronous. There's no such thing as no replication lag. In an ideal world, you keep your replication lag below one second. That means that your servers are in sync, but there will always be microseconds or milliseconds uh, of replication delay uh, in, in any asynchronous replication topology. Beyond asynchronous, there's the option um, to go semi-synchronous. Uh, it's a plugin to MySQL, and this, this helps to guarantee durability. And semi-sync will only successfully uh, commit a transaction on the source as long as at least at least one replica acknowledges that it has received the event. So before actually getting written and persisted, at least one replica has to acknowledge that it has received. So the, the, the source server will wait for that. Still, there are no guarantees that it will be able to execute it, but it is at least received there and the data is somewhere else also. And in the best practice is to keep the slave as an identical copy. And so if your GTIDs match and you have a row-based replication, you can theoretically guarantee that the servers are in sync. But there's more. There are, since MySQL 5.7, there's InnoDB cluster, and it's a an high availability solution, which is native to MySQL. It's available since 5.7, but it's much improved in 8.0. So if you want to use uh, InnoDB cluster, please use 8.0. Do not go for 5.7 because most of the 
bug fixes and, and features, they are not present in, in 5.7. Uh, under the hood, this uses technology called INODB group replication. And it, it makes you, it make, the cluster will work together as one logical entity instead of individual servers with asynchronous replication. It uses a, a group communication system based on the Paxos communication engine. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to reach me on Twitter. Um, thank you for being here and till next time.